80 million years ago, disaster came to a world ruled by dinosaurs. It came in waves of sand and wind that buried every creature alive. For eons, the dinosaurs lay entombed in a place that would one day be called the Gobi Desert, in a country named Mongolia. Among the dead was one of the strangest dinosaurs that ever lived. It was called Oviraptor. It was swift, smart, lethal. Now only bones tell us about its life and the vicious world it lived in. The bones have given us a glimpse of those ancient times. A dim reflection of life before history. But there is more to the story. still hidden in the vast emptiness of the Gobi. Now, an ambitious expedition is traveling to that distant desert to uncover the secrets of the Oviraptor's world. They don't exactly look like scientists. Often they're mistaken for each other. But Mike Novacek leads the expedition, along with colleague Mark Norell. They could be taken for surfers, but they're from the American Museum of Natural oh. History. Scientists piecing together an ancient jigsaw puzzle of evolution and extinction. Hmm. To me, it's so obviously important. I'm so emotionally bound up in this. I can't imagine why uh, a knowledge of, of our history, of where we come from, isn't important to a human experience. Could you imagine what it would be like to live in the late 20th century and not know that extinction actually existed? There's also just a sense of discovery. I mean, every bone that we find tells us something about how the world was 80 million years ago, which is, which is, is pretty neat just having a sense of history of what the planet was like and what the planet has gone through, I think just increases our appreciation for our own existence. Mike and Mark are about to journey to the sun-scorched badlands of the Gobi. It's a desolate area, a half million dusty square miles of sand, scrub, and red rock cliffs. But it's a paleontologist version of heaven, for this is where the Oviraptors lived and died and lay untouched in the earth for millennia. Then in 1922, one of the most famous scientific expeditions in history wound its way toward Mongolia's dinosaur graveyard. Its leader was a charismatic and controversial explorer named Roy Chapman Andrews. Like Mark and Mike, he came from the American Museum of Natural History. But Andrews was an incurable publicity hound and a scientific cowboy. Where his paleontologist used a camel hair brush, Andrews hacked away with a pickaxe. But he found one of the richest dinosaur boneyards in the world. He returned with a spectacular collection of fossils and a library of stunning film images.
But in the 1920s, communists seized power in Mongolia. The open door to the West slammed shut. For the next 65 years, the fabulous fossil fields of the Gobi were forbidden territory. Now everything's changed. Only token symbols of Russia's domination remain. Finally, Western scientists can return. We don't want those onions. They, they rot. They rot in two days. So. Yeah. Mark and Mike were among the first scientists allowed yeah. in. They're now back for their sixth expedition with the Mongolian Academy yeah. of Sciences. Three kilos? Three kilos. Three kilos. Yeah. All right. I'm ready to rock. I'm ready to roll. They have just enough supplies for a short month and a long way to go. Retracing Andrew's footsteps on their way to one of the richest concentrations of fossils in the world, a place called Ukatolgad. Over a vast span of time, Ukatolgad was ruled by dinosaurs. Dinosaur history can be thought of as a great empire that lasted a few hundred million years. That's a significant slice of the history of life. Imagine that time, from the moment the dinosaurs appeared till now, is a single day. At midnight, dinosaurs first walk the Earth. They're flourishing at noon. They don't go extinct until five in the afternoon. Time passes. The first modern man finally appears a minute and a half before midnight. All of our recorded history takes three and a half seconds. In the Gobi, time seems to have stood still. The Gobi is such a big place, and it, it basically has no life support system. We really have to bring everything with us. So all our food, all our fuel, which we're carrying in a fuel tanker, all our supplies have to be treated like we're actually exploring a polar region. In such a vast area, success is never certain. Even getting there can be a nightmare. Roy Chapman Andrews thought he'd solved the problem in the 20s with a new piece of technology. When it was announced that we were to attempt a scientific exploration of the Gobi Desert with a fleet of motor cars, men said that we were little less than fools. Only camels had been used in that country. We had 40 men, eight motor cars, and 150 camels to carry supplies. It was the biggest land scientific expedition ever to leave the United States. Roy Chapman Andrews. From China, Andrews headed northwest. He left Peking, then crossed over the border and drove deep into the parched heart of outer Mongolia. Mongolia, a land of painted deserts dancing in mirage. Mongolia, a land of mystery, of paradox and promise. A thirsty land, a land of desolation. Gazelles, wild asses, and wolves ranged the marching sands. Few explorers had been there, and they brought back tales of thirst, cold, and hunger. But Andrews found one more thing, mud. Our average speed was only four miles an hour. Rocks, ravines, washouts, and ditches followed one another in rapid succession. 
One might imagine that the roads have gotten better. They have not. And even modern Jeeps aren't built for a desert like the Gobi. We have an electrical problem, and we don't know what it is. It's not a very complicated wiring plan, a Russian Jeep. It's not like a Japanese or American car. Yeah. They're up and running, but next, it's a truck's turn. Piston, huh? We think it's piston number six. A critical breakdown could have severe consequences. End of the expedition is not the end of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> May people make it. Oh, God. With the nearest gas station some 500 miles away, and time already getting tight, things will have to go smoothly from now on. Oh, we're having some mechanical problems. We, we think it's a fuel pump, but we're not sure. This could be way bad. It seems to me I got this thing in there without doing that, the twisty deal. <laughs> Maybe we'll tow it or oh. abandon it. Abandon <laughs> it. Get on with it. The, we can't stay here more than a day. After more than 12 breakdowns, the vehicles all decide to run at the same time. As they enter the dusty dinosaur fields of the Gobi, they're traveling a long way backwards in time. Dinosaurs first appeared some 230 million years ago in a world with a different face. The creatures were thriving a hundred million years later as South America and Africa split apart. About 75 million years ago, in the late Cretaceous period, dinosaurs began to disappear, leaving only bones behind. Their bones were more motionless than the continents. Then in the 1920s, Roy Chapman Andrews came to a remote place in the Gobi Desert he would name the Flaming Cliffs. It was a likely looking place. There appear to be medieval castles with spires and turrets, brick red in the evening light, colossal gateways, walls and ramparts, a labyrinth of ravines and gorges studded with fossil bones make a paradise for the paleontologist. Without a doubt, there were hundreds of bones lying just beneath the surface. But where? If only my eyes could pierce that baffling surface and get a glimpse of what lay concealed. Within minutes, they were finding fossils. Andrews and his team had stumbled onto the mother load of dinosaur bones. They discovered the remains of some 200 different animals, many of them completely new species. The fossils revealed a world that Andrews found alien and terrifying. Dinosaurs were the sort of creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet, or the kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. It was an image our culture nourished for generations. Dinosaurs were fierce, monstrous, and not all that bright. Many of the new ideas about dinosaurs are coming from the amazing boneyard called Ukatolgad. 
The team discovered the site three years ago. Now, to get to the dinosaurs, all they have to do is find it again. The maps in general are pretty lousy for the Gobi Desert. The towns on those maps are myths in many cases. We don't even pay any attention to any of the roads marked on those maps. They're completely wrong. Even a satellite tracking system doesn't always help. So the satellite may know where you are, but the road you need may be in a completely different direction. So it's, the roads here are very confusing. There are no signs, and, and many of them lead nowhere. Mandalobo. Mandalobo is here. So we're going to go, go like this. Yeah. We're a little off course. We're not really lost. We're just a, we're just a bit off course. So we've got to go this away and that away. At times, you have to go in circles to move forward. Roy Chapman Andrews, too, spent more than a few days wandering the Gobi. But in the end, he blundered into a discovery that stunned the world. A member of his expedition literally stumbled across a critical link in the great chain of being. On July 13th, George Olson reported that he had found some fossil eggs. We did not take his story very seriously. Nevertheless, we were all curious enough to go with him to inspect his find. There could be no mistake. Our paleontologist finally said, gentlemen, there is no doubt about it. You are looking at the first dinosaur egg ever found. The discovery made Roy Chapman Andrews a national hero. But the eggs were not alone. Lying above the nest was a bizarre skeleton, a bird-like dinosaur unknown to man. It had apparently been caught in the act of murder, stealing the eggs. So it was forever cursed with the name Oviraptor, Latin for egg thief. It would be years before we discovered the strange truth about the animal called Oviraptor. In the late 20s, the winds of change blew fiercely over the great dinosaur fields of Mongolia. That's when Roy Chapman Andrews was forced to leave the Gobi forever. We are more than ever convinced that Central Asia was a paleontology garden of Eden. Still, we have shown the way, have broken trail as it were. Later, others will reap a rich harvest. Decades later, Mark and Mike are hoping to find the treasures that Andrews left untouched in the sand. After more than a week in the blistering Gobi, they finally reach their goal, the brown hills of Uka Tolgad. With all the delays, they've only got two weeks to work. This is the place where they've pinned all their hopes. With luck, a year of shifting sands has exposed more bones. But even here, there are no guarantees. It is possible to fail in the Gobi. It's a huge area, a huge tract of land. There are lots of rocks, but they don't all contain fossils. You can drive to what looks like the most tantalizing set of badlands you can possibly yeah. imagine and not find one scrap of bone. 
It's a treasure hunt in a way, and uh, it is sort of like finding a needle in a haystack. But on this day, discovery and elation are immediate. Oh, I see it. Yeah, oh, ooh, wonderful. <laughs> Jeez, that's nice. There's the claws. Nice. The side of the skull here. These are the teeth sticking You can up see right these teeth, here. yeah. Each one of these is a socket for a tooth. Yep. Pretty big. This is the hand claw. Okay. It has this big uh, thing right here on it. Retractor bulge, mm -hmm. and it's a hand of an over-after. They've hit the jackpot. Among their first finds are over-raptors, oh, wow. so the creature stuff. Andrews oh, yeah. knew as yeah, Egg that's Thief. It. That's it. Nice yeah, this over, -raptor. over raptor Here's a big manal. Considering that over raptor is one of the rarest dinosaurs in the world, and there have only been a handful of specimens found before we discovered this place, where we found 25. I mean, today we found at least five just in the first 20 minutes. This is really not what paleontology is like. <laughs> Most of the time, you don't go find 12 skeletons in a half an hour. There's another one right there, too. Yeah. Each one of these uh, little mounds of little white flecks sticking out there, that's the eroded rubble of. The sands of Ukatolgad, moving toward a tragic destiny. I think this was an oasis 80 million years ago. There are huge numbers of dinosaurs and other vertebrates congregating around maybe some water. And on occasions, not just one event, but on several occasions, these animals were buried in these sands. We'd have to imagine an enormous sandstorm or an enormous force bearing down on these creatures for such a disaster. Some of the dinosaurs almost look like they're trying to swim to the surface, much like a skier in an avalanche, caught in some cases in their struggle to get out of this sand avalanche or great wall of sand that engulfed them. Perhaps they suffocated in the sand. Hey, I just swept there. Now you've made it all dirty again. Take pride in my work. So next year we'll bring some dust busters. The prehistoric sandstorm buried dinosaurs at every stage of life. And on their first expedition here, Mark and Mike made an unprecedented discovery, a nest with eggs. And inside one was an embryo, the embryo of an oviraptor, like a dinosaur on the half shell. Here was the vicious carnivore, the egg thief, just a tiny baby about to hatch. It was an important discovery, a secret moment in the very beginning of this strange dinosaur's life. This year, they're hoping to find out more about the oviraptor and its fate. There's growing excitement on the far side of the ridge. They think they found a completely new kind of dinosaur, a relative of the oviraptor, and it may shed light on what ultimately happened to the dinosaurs. We have no idea what this is. It's a really big animal. It might be something new. This specimen has a lot of important implications that go beyond just being a really beautiful object, so. It's, a, it's exactly what we wanted to find. We hope. <laughs> the skeleton is what's important. Mark and Mike believe that these bones may help prove an exciting theory that some dinosaurs actually evolved 
they evolved into creatures that are still alive today. The bones tell the story. There are uncanny similarities in the skeletons of certain dinosaurs, like these. And modern birds. Almost without doubt, they shared a close common ancestor. And each new find may help prove that dinosaurs did not really go extinct, that birds, in fact, are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs need to be thought of as incredibly successful animals that exist with us today. We just call them birds. Our skies are filled with dinosaurs. It's a bad metaphor to use to call something like dinosaur-like, you know, just because it's old, obsolete, ugly, stupid, and slow. I mean, that, uh, that's not what these animals are, are all about. I mean, it's like the swifts flying around here and things. I mean, they're a type of dinosaur, and that they're still with us now. And the closest relative to birds is these small carnivorous dinosaurs we've collected in these red rocks. At day's end, hopes are high that this new find will help connect the dots between dinosaurs and birds. <laughs> the feeling of anticipation is palpable if not always exactly in key. First thing in the morning, they're back at the site. So we hope we got something we can identify eventually. So Mike, work on that. Kill that beetle while you're at it. Here we go, Mark. Okay, pry it up. As they pry the rock open, they sense trouble. Yeah. Hello. <sighs> Look at that. Yeah. I don't know what that is. We're a bunch of uh, scutes, maybe. I'm afraid to say. Could it be a theropod with our eyes? No. no. Well, that could be, but there's... It's not known to science. I think what we're looking at is that there's a dead theropod right there that's gone, and we're excavating an ankylosaur. And the ankylosaurs are among the most common dinosaurs around. It's not a new dinosaur at all. It's not even related to birds. I'll show you. Clean, clean I'm sure this is an ankylosaur. I mean, I'm like 100% So do you want to just positive. go away? What they want to do now is give up. All that work. Today, the dinosaur hunters have tracked down approximately zilch. Well, you win a, a few and you lose a few. That's just, I don't feel too good right now. <laughs> I'm tired. They've spent two fruitless days working in the blistering heat. But tomorrow will be another day. With any luck, a better one. Instead, nature decides to add insult to injury. Say, ik boro. It's raining. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I'm bored. Yeah. yeah. With a dollar in my hand.
The sun burns off the disappointment. It's a new day and a new dig. This find is not a new species. It's not related to birds, and it's not an oviraptor. But it probably was the oviraptor's prey. It's an animal called Protoceratops. They called these guys the cows of the Cretaceous. They were sort of everywhere. They roamed around, they think, maybe in herds. And... It's full of spikes. We actually uh, call it spiky now. <laughs> Yeah. We've sort of bonded with this one. These are the eyes and the snout. So we're looking at the skull from the top. These are cheek spikes and the frill covering the neck here. Protoceratops was a bizarre dinosaur. A hog-sized animal with a beak like a parrot's a strict vegetarian that grazed the ancient Gobi. Around its head was an elaborate shield, but the shield didn't protect it from its enemies. Enemies like the Oviraptor. And that's exactly what the team digs up next. Oviraptors, a pair of them, lying so close together they seem to describe an ancient romance. Yeah, we're kind of fond of them. Yeah. We're trying to figure out what names to give them. Sure. <laughs> what well, you know? Uh, Ozzie and Harriet, Romeo and Juliet. Batman and side. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a hypothesis. They were holding hands. They were sort of reaching for each other across the miles. The star-crossed over raptors are given the permanent nicknames of Romeo and Juliet. So we have one hand just uh, down here. This is the other one. Krista now is gluing another hand. And uh, this is, of course, the neck coming up and the head and the hip bone. And over here, we have a claw. It's a long, hard process to excavate the past but they've done it before. Over the last few years, they've uncovered a world of almost preposterous beings. Some are related to birds. Others are even related to us. Our tiny ancestors, mammals that lived alongside the oviraptors. Most of these mammals were small, like early mice and shrews. But these insignificant creatures gradually evolved into all the mammals of our world. The cats, the aardvarks, the whales, and even human beings. Sometimes evolution has to take a back seat to hygiene. We don't have much water here, so it's kind of hard to keep things clean. I, I thought I packed more shorts. For some reason, I messed up. <laughs> I, I'm, I've got these on delicate. Yeah, personal grooming is a, is a passion of the camp here. <laughs> The team spends a lot of time making sure that they're, they're groomed, looking their best at all times. Because you never know, there may be some formal affairs in a nearby village that you might need to attend. There are only a few days left. It's time for the second act of Romeo and Juliet. The oviraptors wow. await a sheltering shroud of rags and plaster. They're now in the skillful hands of preparator Amy Davidson. I love skeletons. I, I actually never was that into dinosaurs as a kid, but I've always loved bones. And um, 
I have a, a background as a sculptor, and um, I, I've always admired the skeletons that we all have inside us as one of the most beautiful sculpture on Earth. And these fossil skeletons look almost as well preserved as, as yesterday's camel skeleton, but they're a dinosaur, <laughs> you know. These fossils are forever. It almost lasted forever. For 80 million years, Romeo and Juliet lay together, reaching toward each other in death. What were they like in life? Did they hunt together, share food with each other, fight with each other? Or was this love among the Oviraptors? Scientists may never know for certain if the bird-like oviraptors fell in love, but now there's a new find that digs even deeper into the private lives of the dinosaurs, a place paleontologists usually enter only in their best dreams. Oh yeah, it's farther down. They've discovered another oviraptor. And then, in the dirt below the skeleton, eggs, an entire nest. How many eggs now revealed? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then three over there, 12. <laughs> 12. 12 eggs. All right. There's another one coming out right here. Now, this is really a great fossil find because it's one of the rare instances where we can capture a little bit of behavior that's 80 million years old. Here we have a, a sort of a day in the life or, or the death of a, of a creature, of a dinosaur, in association with something it did during its life. This one was fossilized where it dropped and it happened to drop right on top of its own nest. She didn't just drop there. The good mother oviraptor was sitting on the nest. They probably brought food to their nest, as birds do. And the good mother tended her eggs. Like a bird, she prodded them into a circle. The fearsome carnivore of the Gobi was parenting. So the story of the dinosaur named Egg Thief has finally come full circle. The oviraptors watched over their eggs and took care of the nest. Now they will never be seen as simply nightmare creatures again. The dig has been everything the team could hope for. But to see what they've really got, they have to get all the fossils safely out of the ground and then take them on a trip exactly halfway round the world. <laughs> Sheathed in plaster, Romeo and Juliet are now heavy, but dangerously delicate, like Rice Krispies wrapped in concrete. No, no, you are that way. Okay, okay, go first. Sorry, I thought you were push back. Perfect. It's beautiful, Amy. More, 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 it's more, 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 Nothing came out. Yeah. Right, Amy. Yeah. So far, so good. Now they have to convince the good mother oviraptor to come down from her hillside perch. It's like moving a grand piano off a cliff. Romeo and Juliet proved just as stubborn. Yeah, 
Just drive slowly, <laughs> please. <laughs> It's not there yet. Could get lost in the mail. <laughs> They do get lost in the mail. The good mother over Raptor and Romeo and Juliet are trucked east. And then they disappear, lost somewhere in China. After four months bound up in Chinese red tape, the dinosaur fossils finally make it to their destination. The American Museum of Natural History in New York. The first arrival is Juliet. She's headed for Amy's lab, where if all goes well, they'll find out what ancient secrets lie beneath the recent coat of plaster. I'm really glad this is here. This is great. From the summer in the Gobi to the winter in New York City. <laughs> Juliet is now a seasoned world traveler. After 80 million years of repose, she's the new kid on the block. There's a lot of questions at this point. There could be anything in here. I have a feeling that this one's gonna be a nice skeleton. Oh, this is my guess. A nice skeleton, uh, hopefully with a skull all laid out. It's, it's pretty fun <laughs> and it's all mine. It's a tricky business. Millimeters make all the difference. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. I'm really glad I didn't saw through a bone in the process. It's um, it's weird. It's just opening this little window into uh, into this world I was living last summer. Yeah, this looks good. After all this work, they still don't know if Juliet is an important specimen, whether her skeleton is perfect or a total ruin. Oh, this is great. I'm, I'm really sorry, because uh, this is the skull. Um, it does have a skull. We're really, really happy. <laughs> I like... It, you know, working late at night, it's really hard to go home because I just look at it and say, I can't believe this. It's traveled 80 million years and halfway around the world, and it's sitting here, and, it, you know, it's a dinosaur. Working late tonight. And it's so beautiful. It's the more I work on it, the more you see this natural sculpture my work just sort of disappears and this beautiful thing comes out of the rock. The process takes weeks. Finally, Juliet is revealed in all her splendor She's everything they've been hoping for. Perhaps the most perfect specimen ever found. A dinosaur for the ages. It's a beautiful fossil. In fact, I mean, that. I think that, that this is probably the best prepared and the best preserved uh, oviraptor that's 
yet been worked on from our expedition or even anywhere in the world. I think we're going to have the, to be able to relish in the fruits of last summer for many years to come. Makes you wonder what's still out there. She's more than a pretty face. These bones will help us trace the evolution of dinosaurs into birds. Meanwhile, Juliet makes a scientist dream about the world she left behind. I think what fascinates me is the broad picture. What was it like if you were flying in a little Piper Cub over that area like some of the bush pilots do over the Serengeti? What would it look like then? All those dinosaurs and the mammals and the lizards and the goby. After six long summers, Mark and Mike have uncovered the hidden secrets of the Gobi, making Juliet's world feel almost real. You could picture a lake, perhaps, and some cliffs, and a bunch of oviraptors on a cliff, like a colony of seabirds, perhaps. And a bunch of these tank-like ankylosaurs lumbering around near the pond. And perhaps a herd of protoceratops wandering through. And every once in a while, a vicious velociraptor coming over the hill to nab something. And we can imagine the Oviraptors, Romeo and Juliet hunting together, and the good mother minding her eggs. Unnoticed in its low station is our own ancestor, a tiny, tense creature lost among the powerful beings of the ancient Gobi. disappear from the face of the earth, along with most of the creatures of their world. perspective, of course, uh, this mass extinction event is not a big problem <laughs> because we're part of the group that survived and started evolving into bats and, and large hoofed animals and lions and tigers and bears and ultimately humans. Ultimately humans, like the oviraptors and most of the dinosaur kingdom, may not be able to count on permanent residence on Earth. Every species that's ever lived has become extinct, or will become extinct. And whether extinction is due to the total decimation of a population, or whether it's due to the evolution of that species into another species, nevertheless, everybody becomes extinct eventually. So 
in that view, we've had it. Some species lived and then died out, a story like any other story. Others evolved, changed, and lived on. So perhaps a message about our own future is encoded in these silent remnants of the past. The only real knowledge we have of our distant biological past is from the fossil record. And uh, it gives us a sense of who we are, and where we sit in the world, and what that world might become. Time is the hardest rock to pierce. And the story of life, with its infinite changes, is the greatest mystery we have. But the expedition has been blessed with luck. They've gazed into the past and brought the violent and tender world of the Overraptor that much closer to our own.